the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad So mashallah, we've had some incredible speakers and I'm just proud to be their funny, nerdy friend that gets to tag along. <laughs> Did not. I just, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So I, I, I want to just dive right in just because Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha, there's so much about her and I want to make sure that we talk about it. Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha was, they called her the, subhanAllah, they said that she was the female version of her father. And this was the description of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha. And like even down, down to the details, like she walked like him, she talked like him, like she was just embodied the Prophet sallallahu And we know from also from Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu when they asked her, what is the Prophet sallallahu character? She said, kana Qur'an al yamshi. He was the walking Qur'an. He was a personification of the Qur'an. You hear about these ideals in the Qur'an, you learn about them, you read about them. And sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he personified them. And she was the female version of him. SubhanAllah. We talked a lot about, oh, we talked a lot about lineages, mashallah. And no one has a cooler lineage than Fatima radiallahu anha. So the Prophet sallallahu in talking about his own lineage, he said that always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any time that there was a point where there was a, a split in the, in the family tree, he would always pick the purest, and then the Prophet sallallahu would come from the pure side of that tree. And it kept going and going, and the Prophet sallallahu even describing his own lineage, he said in his entire lineage, going back to Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, nikah la sifah, it was all through marriage. Every person in the Prophet sallallahu lineage was in a committed, loving relationship. Subhanallah. And now you can imagine the Prophet ﷺ, Mary Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha, who we just learned about, and their daughter is Fatima radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. So they had four daughters, subhanallah, and in a community where like the Arabs would, as we had mentioned, they, if a daughter is born, especially if she is the firstborn, they would bury their daughters alive. May Allah protect us. SubhanAllah, now you don't see people physically do that, but you see them crush their daughters, unfortunately. And the Prophet ﷺ had a daughter, and Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anhu, they had a daughter Zainab radiallahu anha, and they threw a huge party, they were so excited. And then they had another child, Sayyidah Ruqayya radiallahu anha, huge party. Sayyidah Um Kulthum, and every time they have another daughter, everybody's like, they're still celebrating their daughters? And she was the fourth one. Imagine that much celebration, they threw a huge party when she was born. And there's a significant thing that happened the year that she was born, they were rebuilding the Kaaba. So there came all of these floods and the, the structure of the Kaaba was starting to, to really just have some damage to it and they decided they had to rebuild the Kaaba. And what they did is, subhanAllah, they started rebuilding the Kaaba and the only thing left was that they needed to put the black stone. This is a famous story, I don't know, I'm sure some of you have heard it before. And it's such an honor to be able to be the one that put the black stone. And they start fighting over it. Until somebody is like, that's it, this is war. We're literally going to kill each other over this. And then somebody's like, wait, 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 let's not kill each other over this. Let's wait till the next person walks in. And whoever the next person is, they'll decide. And you can imagine everybody's waiting. It's like, please let it be my tribe. Please let it be my tribe. They're just waiting so that the next person comes in from their tribe so that their tribe can get that honor. And the Prophet ﷺ walks in and they say, The most trustworthy, we are happy with his counsel, we are content with what he decides. And the Prophet ﷺ, in his wisdom, he gets them to work off their anger. He takes, the black, he takes off his aba, his outer cloak, he puts it on the ground, puts the black stone on top of it, takes a representative from each of the tribes, they walk around carrying it in the show of unity, walking off their anger. He brings together everyone in Mecca, and that was the year she was born. The Prophet ﷺ was born when? In specific, the year of? The year of the elephant. She was born in the year of the rebuilding of the Kaaba. So there's so many parallels, subhanAllah. They named her Fatima radiallahu anha. So it was almost like um, in hopes that Fatima is when a child is nursing, and then you stop nursing the child, i.e. they survive through through childhood, through the, their early stages. So when you name someone Fatima, it is in hopes that one day they will have a lot of children and they will nurse a lot of children and a lot of those children will survive and live to supersede and to go past them, subhanAllah. So they named her Fatima radiallahu anha. Also, fun fact, she's named after her two grandmothers. So the mother of Khadija radiallahu anha was named Fatima. And the wife of Abu Talib, 
who is the, a consistent motherly figure in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and there's so many descriptions where he talks about her. He said, like, the, the, Abu Talib had 10 kids, and everybody would eat, and there wouldn't be food left for the Prophet ﷺ, but Sayyid, his, Abu Talib's wife, Fatima, she'd, she'd hide some food for him. She'd say, كَانَتْ تُخْبِئَ لِيَ الْخَبِئَ These are her actual children, and she's hiding food for the Prophet ﷺ. So they named her Fatima after those two women, subhanAllah. Her nickname, so Al-Fatima, they, they, she had a number of other names. Al-Batul is the one who recedes and leaves everyone around her and goes into worship and seclusion. So this was reminiscent of Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam. They called Maryam, Maryam al-Batul. SubhanAllah, you see how she takes from all of the different mothers, SubhanAllah. The culmination of so much beauty, SubhanAllah. Her name is Zahra. I, don't, I learned this recently about makeup. You have an undertone. I did not know this. See, I studied engineering. When you're a woman in engineering, you don't try very hard. You're already the prettiest one there because you're one of the three girls. Never learned how to do makeup. <laughs> but her undertone was red. So in, similar to her father, they said when he got angry, his face turned red. She looked exactly like him. Her face would turn red. She had rosy cheeks. They called her a Zahra. A Zahra is like a flower. SubhanAllah. So those are some of her nicknames. And subhanAllah, she was an example of every time they would give an example of someone, the extent of the love of the Prophet ﷺ, they would use Fatima as the example. So when the Prophet ﷺ is doing da'wah for the first time, he's saying, Ya Fatima bint Muhammad. Ya Fatima binti Rasulina. Oh Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Alini min mali ma shi'ti. Ask me for my money, whatever you want. Whatever worldly things you need, I, I'll give you. But I can't protect you from Allah. You still have to make this decision for yourself. And later someone comes to him, he's like, oh, there's a noble woman, but she stole, so let's not, you know, let's not apply the punishment to her. The Prophet ﷺ got angry. He said, what, you think we're a society where we only punish the people that are poor? This is what destroyed the people before us. We're not doing that. And the example he gave, he said, even the most beloved person to me, if Fatima, bint Muhammad وسلم, if she stole, I, I would apply the punishment to her. Because again, he keeps using her as an example of the epitome of love, subhanAllah. Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha, so now she is born in the five years before the beginning of the revelation. And as a child, she was a witness to so much of what happened during the life of the Prophet So by the time the revelation came, her older sister Zainab had already gotten married and moved out. And her two older sisters, Ruqayya and Um Kuthum, had also gotten married and moved out. And Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha, she said, you know, if I stay home, I get to hang out with my parents. And her parents are Muhammad sallallahu and Khadija radiallahu anha. And she's like, I'm not getting married. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm going to stay here. SubhanAllah. And just a little bit about the relationship between the sisters. So Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu anha was like a second mother to her. They were very, very close. And Ruqayya and Um Kulthum radiallahu anhunna, they were like, you know those siblings that are inseparable? That was Ruqayya and Umkrithum radiallahu anhunna. They were always inseparable, and Sayyidina Zainab and Fatima radiallahu anhum were very close. Also, something that's interesting about how the Prophet's fatherhood, it was tradition that the eldest daughter would marry someone from, the, from her father's side of the family. And Sayyidina Zainab radiallahu anha really liked Al Asim ibn Rabi'a radiallahu anhu, who was from her mother's side of the family. And the Prophet was not about to break his daughter's heart over a stupid tradition. Because that was the fatherhood of the Prophet ﷺ. They were so unique in Arabian society. So much so that Abu Lahab came and was like, Oh my God, what did you do? The next two girls have to marry from the father's side of the family. And they married from the father's side of the family. And they all moved out. And she was, Fatima is like, I'm going to stay here. And then sure enough, as the revelation became, can you imagine just being a fly on the wall in that house? Fatima <laughs> being a child in that house. Getting to witness all of this, witnessing the Prophet ﷺ being wrapped up. Witnessing what her mother told him ﷺ. Witnessing all of this. One of the other names that she had was Ummi Abiha, the, the mother to her father. It's kind of funny. But she was such a nurturing person, subhanAllah. She was the person, they call it emotional labor. Can you imagine the weight her father is carrying? And she was the one that was there for him the most emotionally. Radiallahu anha. We talk so much about womanhood. A lot of our womanhood is caring and loving other people. And it's thankless. No one ever says, oh, by the way, thank you. <laughs> this is why there's so many narrations about thank your mothers. 
Be kind to your mothers because they're the ones that are doing this work. But even not just motherhood, like as women in our community, when you realize who's actually doing stuff, the majority of the time, it's the women. And who's carrying the heaviest load? Usually it's the women. And not a load of just like, oh, oh, I'm carrying the table. No, I'm carrying with you in my heart your pain. And I love you and I care about you. My students asked me when I first started, like, what's your job? I'm like, honestly, the biggest part of my job is I make du'a for you. I just love you enough to make du'a for you. This is, this is what I feel like our spiritual leadership is, that you know someone that loves you enough that ask the creator of the universe to be on your side. That's what love is, subhanAllah. This is what our spiritual path is. And that's what Fatima radiallahu anha was for, for her own father. When she was a little girl, she saw Abu Lahab force his sons to divorce her sisters. They came back home. She saw when the Prophet ﷺ was praying in front of the Kaaba, they took the entails of like an animal, put it on his head, and it was heavy. And no one could dare walk up because they beat up anyone that came and helped it. But this little girl, she walked up, she cried, she pushed it off of her father's head. She was so consistently there for her father, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And when you think of the tragedy that happened in the Prophet sallallahu life, it happened in her life too. She lost her mother. It was the year of sorrow, they boycotted their family, she lost her mother and she went to the Prophet ﷺ afterwards and she's in tears, she's saying, I can't sleep. I can't, I, what do I, where is my mother? He tells her she's in Jannah, she's in, she's in a happy place, subhanAllah. One of the greatest relief when you lose someone is knowing that they're in a better place, subhanAllah. She loses her mother. And subhanAllah, not too long after she lost her mother, one of the other companions goes to the Prophet ﷺ and she tells him, She tells him, she's like, you know, who's going to help you with your children and your household? And he says, Who can ever be after Khadija? He started, she could see he was shaken and she felt, the, the Sahabiya Khawla she was saying, I felt guilty that I even brought this up. And he told her, he's like, no, who do you mean? We said Sayyidah Sauda radiallahu anha and Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha. So the Prophet ﷺ proposed to both of them. Sayyidah Sauda radiallahu anha joined the Prophet ﷺ's household. By then, it was her, so Sayyidah Ruqayya radiallahu anha married, we just heard, married Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anha, and moved to Habasha. They went with the first migration to Habasha, to Abyssinia, and then they came back. SubhanAllah. So again, her family, the original happy household of the Prophet ﷺ, she was the one that was trying to maintain it for the Prophet ﷺ, maintaining this home for him, sallallahu alayhi wa Every time someone would propose, and it's not like, like random people propose, like Abu Bakr proposed, and she's like, mm, I want to stay with my father. Umar proposed, and she's like, I want to stay with my father. She stayed with her father up until the point where her father and Abu Bakr did the hijrah, because like, if the family of the Prophet ﷺ leaves, they're going to try to kill him. So she's worried for her father, but he has to leave. And her and her sister, Umm Kuthum, are actually left behind. And they end up doing the migration later. We know the story of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu sleeping in the, the bed of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Fatima and Umm Kuthum radiallahu anhu, we usually don't hear the stories and the sacrifice of the women, also stayed behind as a protection for his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if they left, people would try to cut, find him and kill him. So they realize the Prophet sallallahu is gone and now it's safe for them to go. And she's on an animal, and one of the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ kicked the animal until she fell off and she was hurt. And her and Umm Kuthum walked the rest of the way to Medina. Imagine this sacrifice. It takes two weeks by, by horseback or by camelback. Now it's like, what, four hour drive? She walked that. Her and her, mother, her, and her sister Umm Kuthum. And they get to Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ is married to Sayyidah Sauda radiallahu anha. And now for the first time, her father is moving on and he's getting married. So now she starts to consider marriage for herself. And the Prophet ﷺ knows who she likes. He knows his daughter as well. He would never break his daughter's hearts. SubhanAllah. These other people come and propose and they're like, Prophet ﷺ is like, no, thanks, but no thanks. Until Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anha, people are like, we think he likes you. He's like, but what am I supposed to do? And mind you, Ali didn't have a lot of money. 
We talked about how Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu gave away all of her wealth. But that was the wealth of the Prophet sallallahu is wealth as well. And Fatima radiallahu anha's wealth as well. They didn't have money left. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anha didn't have a lot of money. He grew up in the household of the Prophet sallallahu They grew up together. They were really close. You could say they were childhood friends. And subhanAllah, he goes to the Prophet sallallahu house and he just goes and he stands in front of the Prophet sallallahu and just loses his nerve and just sits there. <laughs> How are you supposed to go to the Prophet and it's like, can I marry your daughter? Like, how are you supposed to do that? <laughs> Until the Prophet looks at him and says, did you need something, Ali? And then he's like, right, so funny, subhanAllah. And then he's like, yeah, we're asking about Fatima. And the Prophet says, ahlan wa sahlan. Like, okay, you're welcome. And then he's like, he just got up and left. He didn't even know what to do next. <laughs> so then they told him, like, no, no, go back. Go back and officially propose. He already told you it's okay. So he goes back and he proposes to Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu anha, officially proposes. And the Prophet sallallahu says, do you have something to give her as a gift? He's like, I don't have anything. He didn't, he didn't have wealth. And the Prophet sallallahu said, remember, you had this zitter, you had, you had this shield. You have one thing. Go get that one thing. <laughs> So he goes, gets the one thing, and he comes back. And also, like, I'm trying to imagine, say the Fatima and is like, hey, I got my dowry is a shield. <laughs> but so indicative of her life, subhanAllah. They sell the shield, and she ends up with one pillow, one cover. Her house is so simple. So simple. SubhanAllah. And she marries Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. And there's a moment where Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu tell, is thinking about taking a second wife, because this was normal for the Arabs at the time. Say the Fatima is like, mm -mm. you are not doing that. <laughs> she goes and she complains to her father. And her father actually goes to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. He's like, you know, Al-Asr ibn Rabi'ah, Zainab's husband, wasn't even Muslim. And when I told him he wasn't allowed to take a second wife, like he was down with it. And then he tells him, Fatima minni, Fatima's bid'atun minni, is a part of me. What hurts her, hurts me. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu is like, I will not do anything that will harm her. Their house in Medina, subhanAllah, when you go to, has, who's been to Medina? Anyone? Alhamdulillah. So the Prophet sallallahu is buried in Hujjat Aisha radiallahu anhu, in the house of Aisha radiallahu anhu, and their rooms, they were, um, what is now a large walk-in closet is the size of their rooms. That was their houses. And they had a row of houses, the mothers of the believers radiallahu anhu, and Sayyidina Fatima and Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhum also had a small house. The Prophet sallallahu on his way to Fajr, he would call out to them, and he says, it's time for Fajr. Nama yuridullahu ayyuthi ba'ankum al-rijsa ahl al-bayt. He says, and he recites the ayah of some surah al-Ahzab, ayah number 33, where he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to remove any, any, like, any evil from you, O family of the Prophet sallallahu Come wake up, come to Fajr. They were neighbors, they, they were right next to each other. The Prophet وسلم, every time he would travel, he would come back and the first thing he would do is that he would go to the house of Fatima radiallahu anha and he would give her salams. And any time he walked into a room, or she, sorry, any time he was sitting there and she walked into a room, he would stand up for her. He would go, he would kiss her. And he would have her sit in his spot, wherever he was sitting. Or he would have her sit right exactly next to him. And she would do the same for him. They clearly had a deep, deep bond. There's so many narrations of like, and then someone came in and the Prophet Sallallahu was, was taking a shower and Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu was the one that was holding the cover for him so he could shower. Just normal day-to-day -day life. She was just there for him every single time, subhanAllah. And she would have a disagreement with Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. They're a young couple. We have this idea of like, the perfect marriage doesn't have challenges. You argue about stuff. The best couple in the world fights over the thermostat. Every couple fights over the thermostat. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And the Prophet Sallallahu they, like, they had this discussion once and she was frustrated with him and he went to pray in the went and fell asleep in the masjid and the Prophet Sallallahu woke him up. He's like, Qum ya Aba Turab. <laughs> get up, the one covered in dirt. Come on, get up. What's going on? What's wrong with you and Fatima radiallahu anha? And he goes and he reconciles between them. SubhanAllah. One of the days, their things got really difficult because they didn't have a lot, they didn't have wealth. Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu anha asked, he, her husband told her, he's like, ask your father if we can get support, if we can get like a, someone to come help us at home. And she went to her father and then she lost her nerve and came back. She's like, I couldn't ask him. So he's like, I'll go ask. So then he goes back and they ask him and the Prophet says, I can't give you 
when there are people that are hungry, when Ahl al-Sufa don't have to eat. So Ahl al-Sufa was essentially a homeless shelter in the, in the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, where anyone that didn't have anywhere else to go went to the Masjid. This is what our masajid should be. It should be the place where people, when people are in need, they should know to just come to the Masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ told them, I can't give you wealth when Ahl al-Sufa don't have to eat. And then it hurt his heart. He said, I, I can't. He just turned down his daughter. It hurt him. So he went back to them and he told them, let me give you something that's better. After every salah, say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, la ilaha, uh, sorry, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, 10 times each. And before you go to sleep, say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar, 33, 33, and 34 times each. And Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, 30 years later, he said, we never, like, we never missed a night. Every single time. Every single time. SubhanAllah. In the fourth, SubhanAllah, they, over time, she ended up, started having her own children. And the Prophet ﷺ was so excited having children because she had children. SubhanAllah, he lost his, his sons when they were young. And she was there to witness her parents losing their child. And the Meccans like celebrating the death of her brother. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. They're horrible people. Celebrates the death of a child. SubhanAllah. So finally she has her own children. She has Sayyidina al-Hasan in the third year of the Hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ is ecstatic. He loved her kids. Sayyidina Hussain Hussain was in the fourth year of the Hijrah, and there's so many stories. Like the Prophet is in sujood, and one day they're in Salah, and then the Prophet just never comes up from sujood, and they're just sitting there, they're waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> He's making sujood for a long time. Till finally he gets up, and they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? And he said, oh, you know, Hassan and Hussain were sitting on my head, I was waiting till they were done. <laughs> Any masjid that doesn't have children, be worried about the next generation. Any masjid that doesn't have women, really be worried about the next generation. Well, actually, no, be worried about this generation because if the women aren't there, you're really screwing up. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Then she had her daughter Zainab in the fifth year of the Hijrah, and Umm Kuthum. She named her children after her sisters. SubhanAllah, so, so much beauty. Like, you could feel the love emanating from this family. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So... As she also had her children, they also had dreams about their children. And the Prophet ﷺ, as each of her children were born, because she, out of all of the, the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ, came through Fatima radiallahu came through the children of Sayyid, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu and Fatima. The only one exception was Sayyidina Zainab radiallahu one of her daughters actually ended up marrying Sayyidina Ali radiallahu after the passing of Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu So again, all of the lineage came from there. And her children, we talked about Ahl al-Sufa, how she would go and she would feed them. So much so, there's a narration actually in Surah... Uh, how much time do I have? I'm going to keep going until you tell me to stop. I love you too. Okay. Sounds good. SubhanAllah, in Surah Al-Insan, which in and of itself is the, the Surah of the human. What is the, what is the state of humanity? SubhanAllah. What does it mean to be a human being? All of philosophy is based on what is, what is man, except, I'm not going to go down there. That, I have seven minutes, I won't go down that road. SubhanAllah, in that surah, ayah number 8 through 10, actually describes a situation that happened to Sayyidina Ali and Fatima radiallahu anhu. So they were fasting, and the ayah says, وَيَتِيمًا And they feed the food, despite their love for it, someone who is impoverished, an orphan, and a prisoner of war. So the first day they're fasting, and they have food, and they're about to eat, and someone comes and knocks on the door, and he says, Ya Ahl Bayti Rasulillah, O family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi I'm one of the poor of the Muslims. So they give him the food, and the only thing they have water left is water. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi sorry, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, Fatima, and Hassan Hussein only drink water. And then the next day, again, they have food, and they're excited. They didn't eat the day before. And they have food, and someone knocks on the door, and it says, I'm an orphan, and they give him food. And they just drink water, they break their fast on water, and then the third day, a prisoner of war. And after the third day, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ comes and realizes they're his neighbors and they're hungry. They haven't eaten in three days. SubhanAllah, and he sees the children crying, they're hungry. And the Prophet ﷺ, it hurts his heart that the, his family is hungry. And subhanAllah, Sayyidina al Hassan was known for his eloquence. Sayyidina Hussain al subhanAllah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about him in a second. SubhanAllah, they go to the Prophet ﷺ and he realizes that they're in pain and he finds them food. 
But it's so beautiful. The next ayah says, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُنِيدُ مِكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا We feed you for the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want from you any reward or any gratitude. We're seeking it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا That we fear from our Lord a day where like, Abasa is like, that. you know how you're like frowning? قَمْطَرِيرًا This really difficult day, subhanAllah. We fear from Allah a very difficult day. This is why we're feeding you. This was the household of the Prophet ﷺ. Before she passed away, similar to the, the, the narration about her mother, how Sayyidina Jibreel ﷺ came and gave, her, gave the Prophet ﷺ a, a good tidings about his wife Khadija anha. Again, Abu Huraira narrates that an angel is than Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that an angel came and asked to enter to be able to visit me, and he gave me the glad tidings that Fatima would be the leader of the women of my ummah, and that Hassan and Hussein would be the leaders of the young men of the ummah in Jannah. Subhanallah! What a beautiful glad tidings! Subhanallah! Subhanallah! The Prophet Sallallahu towards the end, like in the eighth year of SubhanAllah, we kind of talked about all these things that were happening. In the eighth year of the Hijrah was the conquest of Mecca. That was also the year that Sayyidah Zainab Radulan, her sister passed away. Her sister Ruqayya passed away in the second year of the Hijrah. So after the, this victory of Badr, the Prophet Sallallahu lost his daughter. And everyone in Mecca is celebrating and they feel his pain. But the only person that really truly felt it with him was Sayyidah Fatima Radulan. The conquest of Mecca happens and she loses her sister Zainab radiallahu anha. SubhanAllah. In the ninth year, SubhanAllah, they end up losing Kuthum radiallahu anha. Just so much sorrow happening in the life of the Prophet sallallahu She is the one that is there helping him pick up the pieces every single time. Towards the end of his life, SubhanAllah, he's, he's ill. And everyone's coming to visit him because he's ill and she goes to his house and he whispers something in her ear and she cries. And he whispers something else and she smiles. And Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha is describing this. She said, I've never seen someone smile through sadness like that. And she asked her, what did he say? She said, I can't, I can't expose the secret of the Prophet But after the Prophet passed, she asked her again, she said, what did he say? She said, the first time he told her that Jibreel alayhi salam used to come every year and he used to he used to read the Qur'an with the Prophet ﷺ, and this year he did it twice. This is my end. I'm going to pass from this illness. She cried. I just want to note that out of all of the children of the Prophet ﷺ, the worst thing that happened in the history of the Ummah is the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. The only one that could live, to, live through it was actually Fatima radiallahu It was part of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his other children that they didn't have to live through that. And the only one that had the fortitude to actually live through it and survive it, that had the spiritual resilience to be able to live through that, was Fatima radiallahu anha. And he told her this and she cried. And then he told her, you will be the first of my family to join me. And she smiled. She knew her time was near. SubhanAllah. Six months after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, she passed away on the third day of Ramadan. Her mother passed away when? 27th of Ramadan. So many similarities to the other women. I wanted to point out because her children, Sayyidina al-Hasan, when turmoil started, upheaval started to happen in the, in, in the ummah, Sayyidina al-Hasan was known for his eloquence and he's the one that brought the ummah together. He healed this rift after the death of his father. And afterwards, Sayyidina Hussein Hussain, who was, subhanAllah, he was, he was known for his stutter. There was a moment where, the Prophet, where he comes to speak to the Prophet in the masjid. And you know how everyone all of a sudden goes quiet? And this little boy is talking to his, his grandfather, and he starts to stutter, and he's struggling to get it out. And the Prophet saw how everyone looked at him. And he said, this is the stutter that he inherited from his uncle Musa, Few people spoke truth to power like her children. Sayyidina Hussain radiallahu anh, spoke truth to power. I know this is a dark place in Islamic history, but subhanAllah, the moment where Sayyidina Hussain radiallahu anh, and the men of the family of the Prophet sallam, are killed is because they said spiritual authority will never be subservient to the political authority of the time. What they preserved for the ummah 
till the end of time. She was an educator, she was a stateswoman that raised educators and statespeople that were willing to give their lives for the, for the message of the Prophet And after he is killed, her daughter Zainab becomes the matriarch of the family of the Prophet And they bring her into the court of, of, of the person that killed her family. When Sayyidina Hussein, when they told him, like, there's so much that's happening, and he says, my, my, sa my sanity, like my calm, is knowing that this is all happening unto the merciful eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It wasn't, hey, I'm in this fight and I'm, I'm angry. They sacrificed for Islam and they did it so willingly. And after she witnessed her brothers, her sons, all of the men in her family, except for one, be massacred, she walked, they bring her into the court and they tell her, what did you see today? She said, Lam ara illa jameela. I've never seen anything from my Lord that wasn't beautiful. The family of the Prophet ﷺ, being part of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, meant that you carried a heavier burden than everyone else. Fiqh-wise, they can't receive zakat. So that no one, until the Day of Judgment, can come and say that his family benefited from it. They're actually disadvantaged by being part of the family of the Prophet ﷺ economically. Not disadvantaged in any other way, subhanAllah, it is an honor to be from the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, there's so many hadith where he says, I'm reminding you of the, my family, the family of the Prophet ﷺ. There's this unfortunate idea that the Shia love the family of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sunnis love the, the, the friends of the Prophet ﷺ. It's a Muslim thing to love everyone the Prophet ﷺ loved. <laughs> family, friends, may Allah bring us all with them in the, on, in, on the Day of Judgment and in Jannah with all of them. They all love the Prophet ﷺ. That's what bound them all together. Do not ever let anyone tell you that someone else is, it's, oh, it's part of them to love so-and-so more. No, if the Prophet ﷺ loved them, we love them. And these stupid divisions that people put in the ummah, so unbelievable. If someone says, I love Allah and His Prophet, I love them because they love Allah and His Prophet. We should never let anyone divide us, subhanAllah. The family of the Prophet ﷺ is honored. Until the Day of Judgment, subhanAllah, a lot of them, I'm, I'm from Egypt, so Sayyidah Zainab anha, one of the narrations is that she's buried in Egypt, which the Syrians might fight me over it, but as an Egyptian, I just want to say it's Egypt just because <laughs> the, the legacy of Sayyidah Fatima anha, is the emotional labor of carrying people, including her father, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And I just wanted to end with this, because I, I, I know that like part of the legacy of these women, we had a, we had a session with uh, Dr. Donna Austin, who's a professor at Rutgers University. She was talking about the women in Malcolm X's life. Did you know it was his sister that converted to Sunni Islam before him? Did you know it was his sister that had him transferred to a prison that had a library so he could read? SubhanAllah, the labor that women do. Dr. Betty Shabazz is the one who actually carried on his legacy. His, their youngest daughter recently passed away, I think within the last week, Allah had her Women do emotional labor to love someone that society says is not valuable and should be unlovable is an act of resistance. When we talk about building community, consistent kindness is how we build community. Our love for each other is not, oh, a fun added thing. This is the foundation of what our relationship is in hopes of one day meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when, on the day of judgment, I'm like, Ya Allah, I loved your people because they're your people. SubhanAllah. May Allah continue to fill our hearts with love for each other and allow us to enter into Jannah with ease together. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Jazakum Allah khairan.